I'm Tom Murray. I'm the Director of Innovation for Future Ready Schools, a project of the Alliance for Excellent Education in Washington, D.C. I was fortunate to spend about 15 years in public schools, first as a teacher, then as a middle school principal, as an elementary principal, then I went and I was over at district office for a number of years. But then I've been at the Alliance for about three years. So Future Ready Schools is a movement. It's free, it's bipartisan, it's led by the Alliance, but it's also from a coalition of so many different partners. We have about 60 partners, including AXA, across the country working together to support our school leaders. You know, the world our kids are living in and their world of work in the future is going to be dramatically different than we all grew up. And in order to prepare them, the, the teaching and learning of years past needs to transform to really prepare our learners. And so it's a movement to help shift that. It's grounded in leadership. It's grounded in school culture. But it's a research-based framework of transformation. We provide free tools and free resources to support the great work here in California, but also across the country. Sometimes we think about leaders as people that have a title, leadership by title. And you know, I've met some of the greatest school leaders that are out there that don't have a fancy title after their name. We call them leaders by action. So if you want to talk about great leadership, it's those who do, not just those who talk. You know, I've met some of the greatest superintendents in the world that are up against some of the, the largest challenges. They've got 100% free and reduced lunch in their districts. Their budgets have been slashed, yet they're doing amazing things for kids. Why? Because of their leadership, because of the culture of innovation that they're creating. So what are great leaders? They're those that do whatever it takes to help their kids succeed. You know, I think back seven or eight years ago, and I really wasn't on social media. I had a couple accounts when they first started, really personal stuff. I'd share my kids, I'd share my family. I'm not sure I saw right away the educational value. Today, when I fast forward and I look back, I don't know where I would be without it. And, and I don't mean to sound cliche when I say that. You know, great things are happening in schools every single day. And you know how we can do it? We can tell our stories about it. You see, when I look online, when I look in the news, when I see things are out there, what they're writing about the work of public schools typically is not positive. And it's not reflective of the great work I get to see all the time when I'm working with school leaders. So one aspect of social media is to tell our story. As a longtime school leader in Pennsylvania, one of the things we were up against is as students would start to leave us to go to other opportunities in other schools, we started to lose significant funding. When I was a tech director, we created our own online classes as a public school taught by our own teachers. We had millions of dollars in kids that we were responsible for paying, that state funding would be allocated to, that we had to write checks for in Pennsylvania the way it was, that went to online cyber schools, went to different charter schools. So we had two options. One, we throw our hands up and just say that's not fair and yell a scream or two, create something better and more opportunities for kids. And we chose the second one. So we created our own um, online experiences for kids. So we had students that would come to school a handful of periods a day, take other coursework online. We had kids that were full-time online. What we also started to do is actively recruit back those students that had left us and say, hey, here's opportunities we now have. You can now take these online classes and be part of our system and come play sports and get guidance counseling services and, and those kinds of things there as well. We ended up bringing back hundreds of thousands of dollars of kids over multiple years because we created experience that we hadn't prior. So that competition per se, it forced us to do things differently. When we started to ask kids, why are you leaving those exit surveys? Because they were going to things we weren't providing. It took our brick and mortar traditional structure and forced us to say, how can we do not or not something just different an and 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 so kids started to return we actually started to have other kids we're not it wasn't a full open enrollment state like some states are out there um, but we had kids that started to come to us as we would support other schools in the area as well and it was a win-win for their school but it was also most importantly a win for the child because they had better experiences in their home district in their home boundaries around their neighborhood kids and we could do it well why because we had great teachers and great leadership around to make it happen you know, when I look coast to coast and I see from different states and different leaders and I reflect on my own personal experience kind of growing up in suburban New York, first, I, I've recognized my own privilege as, as a white male working with uh, as a white male with two parents at home with a, a middle class income who would go on vacation occasionally, didn't worry about the clothes I was wearing, the privilege that I had growing up I don't think I really realized. But now as I see nationally and I see some of the poorest areas, whether it's here in California or Mississippi or in New York, not every kid has every opportunity that I have. And you know, that's personally part of the reason I have the drive that I do, because I recognize the privilege that, I, uh, that I've had, and I recognize many, many millions of kids in our nation do not have that. Equity is, a, is core to the work that we do at the Alliance for Excellent Education, as well as Future Ready Schools. Why? Because it cannot be a zip code that dictates the, the quality of an education that a child receives. Every child deserves a high quality education. And you see, what will break the chains of poverty it's education. 
And so how can we raise kids up, bring them out of poverty? It's through the educational outcomes. So how can we serve those kids best? You know, when I think about e equity, there's so many facets of it. There's equity and opportunity. You know, depending on where you go, depending on the high school you go, often depends on the opportunities. And when we look nationwide, traditionally our, our black and Hispanic students have far less opportunities in the rigorous coursework that they can take, in the, in the types of schools that they learn in, in the quality of the, of the buildings that they're in. All research indicates that. We absolutely have to change that system. When we look at things like equity and access, you know, research shows about five million of our nation's families do not have connectivity at home. You see, that's not something that I, I worry about. My biggest concern is I don't have connectivity on some flight flying across the country. What a first world problem that is. But when we have 70% of our nation's teachers asking kids to do something digital outside of the school day, yet five million of our families are not do, don't have connectivity at home, that puts those kids, our neediest kids, in a, a tremendous bind. And you see, when you analyze that those students, and it comes from the Pew Research, disproportionately it's our black and Hispanic families. So one of my challenge for school leadership, what are you doing about it? You know, you can hand kids devices and it's all well and good, but if that child takes that device home and cannot connect, what then? You know, I'm thinking about schools. I, I think about Superintendent of the Year, Russell Booker in South Carolina. One of the things he's doing is he's working through community partnerships. He's partnering with his businesses all throughout his county in South Carolina to be able to say, here's the digital initiatives that we're doing. Here's the skills our kids need for the workforce. But we recognize many kids in our community don't have internet access. Will you, as business partners, partner with us to give kids safe places that they can come work and hop on Wi-Fi after school on the weekends and being able to do so? You know, and what starts to happen is the businesses and the schools start to partner as a community. When you think about it, where do most small businesses live with their owners? They live in our communities or in communities nearby. And so how can we serve our traditionally underserved students? You know, equity and opportunity, equity and access are just two of the areas that we focus on. So when I think about technology, I think about technology use at schools, um, equity is a key component to that. First of all, there's this notion, um, there's a lot of research out there that shows in traditionally underserved areas, um, teachers are using technology for your low level digital drill and kill. And you look at any research on that topic, it's really just actually a waste of money. You know, if, we, if we're just taking worksheets and digitizing past practices and putting them online, there's no shift in pedagogy. All we're doing is spending more money. And from a research end, what we're seeing is in our underserved, traditionally underserved areas, that's the primary use. However, drive out to suburbia, and what you see is teachers that are typically have more training, because there's often more finances there, that are starting to use technology. I shouldn't say starting to use, but have been using technology for higher level. You know, the National Ed Tech Plan um, they differentiate it between active use and passive use. And passive use is more of your consumption based. And we're seeing more consumption based use in some of our urban districts and some of our traditionally underperforming areas as well. But then in many of our richer sub suburban schools, we're seeing some more active use where you see coding, design, creation. And that's what works with ed tech. So when we look at the research, it's the interactive learning what works. It's the use of technology to explore, design, and create. So it's not just simply getting the devices. You know, we've been talking about the digital divide, the has and the have nots, but probably for 15 years at this point. It's the digital use divide coined by the, by the National Ed Tech Plan, which is how the technology use, is used, which is just as important. You see, you can be one-to-one -one in a classroom and not be innovative at all. You can have very little technology and do very innovative things for kids. So still, it's grounded in high-quality instructional practices. So how do we do that? First and foremost, we focus on high-quality teaching and learning, and then we can use technology as an amplifier. But I'm also realistic. A lot of districts are really struggling for cash. You know, they're struggling just to get some of the basics, the notion to, to add all sorts of Chromebooks or iPads or whatever the device might be is definitely a challenge. So I encourage them to seek all means of funding. How can you partner with your community? How can you partner with grants? I'll hear story after story of grants that are being used to fund underserved communities or places or, or groups like Everyone On that are working, the everyoneon.org, um, what they are, their mission is to get families connected. So can we partner with groups like Everyone On to serve our community to be able to help them get connected at home. It doesn't mean as a district we've got to pay for them all to have it at home. That's not realistic. You know, some of our wealthier districts are handing out hot spots and that's all well and good, but for our, our districts that have a lot of kids living in poverty, that's not a sustainable way of doing it. You know, and then the notion of sustainability is key. We can't just buy these devices one time without a plan of saying, okay, three or four years from now when these things are dead, how are we replacing them? Because what'll happen is we'll start to shift teaching and learning and three or four years from now, if we have no plan, we have no vision, we're gonna be in a really bad spot. And you know who loses when we're in that spot? Kids.
So when my co-author Eric Scheninger and I were writing Learning Transformed, we did a lot of research and we were really looking at, you know, when we talk about learning, what is it that actually works? You know, I think about traditional teaching and learning, the stand and deliver, teachers kind of the center of the classroom, desks in rows, kids are facing forward, I give you information, you spit it back, we do it enough times, we call it a grade, we call it a course, and though sometimes we look back and we think, you know, how come the kids can't think for themselves? In those traditional environments, you know, a Gallup released a survey, Gallup surveyed almost a million children nationwide about two years ago. One of the things that they found is they asked a question on engagement and how engaged are you in school. What they found was about 75% of our fifth graders nationwide, three and four, felt engaged in school, engaged in the content. And guess what happened? It went down in sixth and down in seventh, down in eighth, down in ninth, down in tenth, down in eleventh, where it bottomed out at like 32%. One in three of our eleventh graders felt engaged in school. And it ticks up senior year. I personally attribute that to like, oh shoot, I've got to graduate, right? And so when you look at that, one of the ways we could look at it is in our traditional system, the longer we have them, the less engaged they become. Another question they asked was, are fun at school? I have fun at school, and students had to respond to that. High school across the board, across our country, was about one in five kids nationwide said high school was fun. Just process that. We have to redesign the learning experience to be effective. So as we were working through Learning Transform, we were researching what is it that actually works, it's what's personal. So the question really becomes, how do we make learning personal and authentic? How do we leverage student interests, student passions? And it doesn't mean, sometimes when people start to argue, well, if I didn't have to take a test, I could do that. That's a, that, your mindset's thrown off there. And I, it's, it's not um, ignoring state testing or those kinds of things. The purpose is, how do we take the things we need to do? How do we take the standards that we need to reach and do it in personal and authentic ways? Those deeper learning type competencies. Why? When you look at that traditional mode of stand and deliver, multiple studies show the highest I've ever seen in retention rates. I've seen between 5 and 6% in some studies, up to 17 or 18%, but still, that's less than 1 in 5 days or less than 1 in 20 days of content they would actually remember. So ultimately, we're just wasting time. And so how do we teach kids how to learn for their future? When you look at their future, my little boy is the class of 2032. And when I think about his future and his world of work, if he doesn't have the, the, the ability to adapt, the ability to learn in an environment where technology is shifting, where the fourth industrial revolution of automation and robotics are changing the world of work so fast, what are the skills he needs? It's not gonna be regurgitation. It's gonna be adaptability and flexibility and collaboration and communication and the ability to work with others, the social emotional sides of things in that. And so how do we redefine learning? We take a look at the kid first and what is it that that child needs and how do we best teach to that child? So the very best piece of advice that I've ever received came about 30 seconds before the very, my very first bell rang for my very first time on my first day teaching. My mentor, a guy named Mark Weeder, put his, his, his left arm around me in the hallway as we stood out there awaiting the bell to ring. And he said, Tom, before your first day, he said, I've been doing this for 26 years. As your mentor, if there's one thing that I can teach you, if there's one thing that I can teach you as your mentor moving forward, it's this. This job is about loving and caring about kids. This job is about doing whatever it takes for the kids that we serve. This job is about relationships. And he said, Tom, if you forget that, you've got two options. One, get out and go do something different. Or two, refocus on that because this job is about loving and caring about kids and our kids need you. That was moments before the bell rang for the very first time. I will tell you, I've never forgotten it.